are super excited to have as our guest James Connolly from the International Living Future Institute, along with uh, our friend and best customer, Kristen Gertz from Toto USA. And we're here today to talk to you about uh, the introduction of our new product, the Material Health Overview, and how Sustainable Minds, Toto, and the International Living Future Institute have come together to create uh, a simple and very powerful product transparency disclosure and marketing tool that meets the demand of today's product transparency request and makes that information being requested uh, understandable, meaningful, and uh, easy, to, easy to use. So the outline of today's session uh, is going to start out with uh, some background on sustainable mines. Uh, our products, how we developed the transparency report program, and then we'll just hit the question head on, why make a report of a report? Then we'll move into um, the research that we've spent uh, you know, a good last half of the year doing uh, to understand the samenesses and differences between the various material health evaluation and disclosure programs, trying to understand how how will or does or has a manufacturer chosen which program uh, to utilize uh, to report the material health of their products. That's when uh, James will uh, step in and talk specifically about uh, the Living Building Challenge and DECLARE and how DECLARE labels help specifiers in the AEC industry help select products uh, that contribute to Living Building Challenge credits. And then Kristen's going to talk to us about how she's been doing life cycle assessment and material health evaluation, how they build on, on one another, and how she applied for the DECLARE labels and then how that information has shown up in their uh, transparency reports. And certainly talk about why Toto chose DECLARE and then we'll look a little bit more detail about what's in the material health overview. We'll do a demo. You can see a couple of them live. And all the while, I'll be keeping my eye on the chat panel as well as the questions panel. Uh, please feel free to um, type in your questions. And I'll either send them to the presenters during the course of the presentation or we'll take them at the end. And if you've sent in a question that for some reason we don't get to, we will certainly follow up and uh, make sure all your questions get answered. So for those of you who don't know Sustainable Minds, we are a B2B cloud provider of environmental product transparency, applications, data, and services. Our customers are product manufacturers, and we help them both design and now market greener products. Our mission as a company is to operationalize environmental performance into mainstream product development and manufacturing. So it simply just becomes another thing, another criteria that manufacturers integrate both into design and marketing uh, in an understandable, empowering, incredible way for the purpose of driving revenue and growth through greener product innovation. So Environmental performance, material health, it's an innovation, it's a growth strategy, it's a differentiator. And our secret sauce as a company is that we use design and customer experience to inform all of the development we do of our products uh, to help make uh, the complex clear. So we don't look like uh, many of the, or any of the companies in the space that um, we do business in. Uh, we look like a mixture of a few different types. Uh, we are a, an LCA software company, uh, but our software is not designed uh, to do full LCAs for public reporting claims like Gabby or SEMA Pro. Our software is used and was designed specifically for use 
by product development teams in early stage product development to be able to rapidly measure, model, and compare various concepts to ultimately find out where they can make meaningful improvements and make greener products. When we got involved with helping manufacturers market greener products and realized that to deliver PCRs and EPDs in the way that we wanted to to make them understandable and meaningful, we had to add program operator to our business model. And so in that way, we're like uh, the example program operators listed here, but we are a software company. That's, that's who we are, and we have a variety of software products and services. And the way we scale and bring scale to the industry is by collaborating and partnering with LCA and material health providers, verifiers, certifiers, and NGOs and organizations that run programs like uh, ILFI. So a quick view, our, again, I mentioned our software. It's eco-concept modeling and LCA software. We were the first software company to bring the cloud solution to the market specifically for product development teams. We made LCA understandable by creating a single figure score methodology using Tracy, impact categories from the EPA, EcoInvent, and NREL data, and from other public trusted sources, uh, and it's certainly all uh, done under the auspices of ISO guidelines, and uh, there is a, a lengthy uh, methodology report uh, available. So when LEAD introduced LEAD version 4 and product transparency became the cornerstone of LEAD version 4, we realized now was time to move to the next part of the platform and build out the capabilities to help manufacturers market greener products. And it's all the same drivers that, driving, that are driving the demand for designing greener and marketing greener, but even more so, uh, the power of brand uh, becomes even more important. And that got us to thinking about uh, the whole product transparency space and this general term disclosure that's used to describe the document deliverables uh, to present product transparency information. And there just didn't seem to be something right about that word. You know, that why should manufacturers be creating disclosures, uh, you know, synonyms for disclosure? We went and looked it up. They're, they're really not very compelling words. Um, and honestly, we believe, and again, our mission is to operationalize environmental performance in the mainstream product development. If environmental performance is now just another criteria in product development, that manufacturers make trade-off decisions between today, like functional performance, cost, aesthetic, safety, you know, why isn't it just a criteria now in product marketing so that marketers and purchasers and specifiers can have that same information right alongside all the other stuff they use to make decisions so they can easily make trade-offs in that uh, decision-making process. So, you know, a lot of manufacturers are still wondering about the, the value and how do we measure the value of uh, doing product transparency reporting. And really what we believe is that uh, product transparency creates a credibly greener brand. But it's not enough just to produce disclosures because anybody can produce a disclosure and the presence of a disclosure does not mean that the product uh, has been improved from a previous version, uh, that it's better, uh, has reduced environmental performance to a competitor's product. The value of the product transparency reporting is for the manufacturer to demonstrate that they understand what they're doing. They understand the impacts of the products that they're making, and they're taking the information from these studies to drive it back into product development to actually work on uh, building greener products. So 
we believe then making greener purchase decisions requires uh, consistent and understandable and meaningful information. So sharing that information about what is the manufacturer actually doing, you know, do they understand what they're doing and what are they doing to improve, we believe that kind of transparency and that kind of communication builds trust in a brand and trusted brands create value for their companies. So Sustainable Minds, having said all that, we're in the business of helping make greener decisions uh, in design and marketing, and it's all about decision making. Uh, and so now we ask you, who are manufacturers who are, who are on the call, because many of you, uh, and we were very excited to see the great list of folks um, who are attending today, uh, specifiers, designers, manufacturers, uh, NGOs, certifiers, everybody, uh, we have a great assortment of folks. So I pose this question to the manufacturers on the call today, uh, how will you leverage your product transparency investments into sales growth? And if you on the call today uh, are in R&D or product development or sustainability, that's not the first time uh, somebody's asked you that question, I'm sure. Um, and so, you know, increasingly there is this demand. You have lots of people who want this information, reps, partners, distributors, customers. And at the end of the day, not only do they want to know what it means, they can't use the disclosures unless they understand what they mean you know, beyond checking a box. So with the intent to train folks to use it, uh, to help people make better decisions. There's a lot that's currently on uh, people's plate today. And for this to really happen in the marketplace, it has just got to become simpler and easier. And bottom line, simply more, more cost effective with, with a higher payoff. So getting back to the uh, lead version four story, when that first came out, uh, I honestly uh, didn't know what an EPD was. Uh, I asked our LCA technical expert, Ute Meyer, who served on the MRTAG at the time and was one of the authors of the credit language, you know, what's an EPD? He said, Terry, that's what I've been working on. You know, I thought I told you about that. So I di didn't really register. So, you know, my own background is a long time ago, I was a graphic designer. And so when I looked at EPDs, I said, well, it's another kind of brochure. And so if a manufacturer has a brochure for its products that has all the traditional information that people use to make a purchase decision, then why is all the environmental performance information in a separate brochure? And why isn't it with the other stuff all in one place? Um, and so we did a massive study. We looked at about 40 different EPDs from around the world and came to the conclusion that we weren't sure how somebody who wasn't technical or understood LCA would use it to make a purchase decision. And so the insight really was um, we needed to develop a complete transformation of the PCR EPD process to respond to this demand for transparency and that the bottom line really is it's about how the information is reported. Everything else that leads up to that, the PCR creation, the LCA, the inventory, the data gathering, all of that is in service to delivering a report and delivering a report in a way that people can consume and respond to that information. So that's how we developed our transparency report. The transparency report is our brand of EPD. It is a type three environmental declaration, and you can create a transparency report using any new or existing PCR. So watch for next month, we're gonna have another webcast about our compatibility approach, and we'll have some examples of transparency reports made from uh, existing PCRs. We're very excited to um, get the nod from environmental leader, uh, acknowledging yes, uh, innovation in this space is necessary, but really, you know, the, the value to a manufacturer is that 
you're leveraging your investment in LCA to create effective marketing tools and build a, a greener brand. Uh, we decided a transparency report would only be three pages. You know, EPDs can be 10, 20, 30, 40 pages. We said nobody is ever going to read all that. Let's make it three pages and let's make everything somebody needs to make a purchase decision be on one page. Let's make page three optional. Uh, page three is where the manufacturer actually gets to tell meaningful stories about what they're doing to improve uh, the performance of their products across the life cycle. So these stories are supporting what's getting reported on page two. And these data, facts, stories, uh, because they're part of a certified report, you can see NSF has been the certifier of TOTA's reports. These facts are certified. They are actually true um, and not greenwashing. So here's our vision of uh, how greener products get made, uh, that designing and marketing greener products is a continuous improvement loop. And so our products, our transparency report framework, the transparency report program, our showroom where all the, the branch showroom where all the transparency products for manufacturer get promoted, our software where once the LCA has been completed, we'll deliver back to the manufacturer their data from the LCA in Sustainable Mind software. Now they have all the interpretation, now their product development teams can take their models, their data, that interpretation, hopefully improve the performance of their products. And then the next time they do an LCA, they can report uh, those improvements. And in fact, we just introduced a new credit in July for reporting continuous improvement. So the transparency report program delivers three things to manufacturers, a streamlined way to creating uh, PCRs at the product group level, the transparency report, you have a choice of verification levels. We're going to talk now about adding material health. Again, they're in the cloud. We also do deliver PDFs because people still like those, but they're cloud-based reports. And then uh, your data in the software. So once we finished launching the transparency report program, we turned our attention to this other type of product transparency in lead version 4 material ingredients. And this is actually the credit language laying out a number of different methods or programs that can be used to earn that credit. So when we kind of hunkered down to take a look at this, we came away wondering, um, one, why do there need to be so many types of reports that a manufacturer needs to provide? So does a manufacturer really need another brochure? Why are there so many different ways to disclose material ingredients? Why do different AEC professionals ask for, for different material ingredient disclosures? And does that mean a manufacturer needs to get more than one type of certification or create more than one type of disclosure? Does the manufacturer learn something different from each of them? Does the customer learn something different from each of them? And then further, if material health isn't effectively addressed in an LCA and EPD, and a different kind of report is required, then again, why not provide all the information in the same place so that people can use all that information to make purchase decisions? So we did the same thing. We went out and did uh, our research study, uh, looked at the programs that were included um, in LEAD, and made uh, the same conclusion, how do they get used to make a purchase decision? And so that's what drove the creation of our material health overview to help manufacturers leverage the investment in any material evaluation uh, that they find appropriate for them to effectively present a greener brand. And what they've been designed to do is answer these questions very quickly. People don't have a lot of time. What we imagined folks would be looking for are just quick answers to what's in the product? Is there any hazardous ingredient? If yes, how bad is it? Or are they? Are there any exposure concerns? 
where do the materials come from, where do they go, and what's the manufacturer doing to improve the human health impacts. And we created standardized versions for each of these assessment methods, evaluation methods, because each is a little bit different. Uh, but people don't want to have to learn to use different reporting tools. They just want one kind of reporting tool. And so all of these material health overviews use one standard format that have been tailored to deliver the information specific to that method. So I just want to make uh, an analogy here. <coughs> Excuse me. That the deliverable of an LCA uh, is an LCA report. So this is the setup for the analogy. An EPD is a report of the LCA report. So we're already making reports of reports. And then somebody might ask, well, why are those reports still so long? And the answer is because EPDs are disclosures. They're technical documents intended uh, for technical people. So an LCA is to a an LCA is to a transparency report as in this case the declare label is to the material health overview. We've got disclosures on the left and marketing tools on the right. This document, the transparency report, is a type 3 environmental declaration. It's this document that earns the credit in LEED and in other rating systems. However, it is the background report, it is the declare label, which is a manufacturer's inventory, and we're going to talk about that, that earns TOTO the credit for material health reporting not the material health overview. It's the background report. So in looking at these comparisons between these programs, uh, we started out looking at the credit language. Uh, there's three options, but we're only going to focus on option one because you can't earn option two or option three until you've earned option one. So. We broke it down, we wanted to understand, okay, each of these programs are administered by a different organization. They all deliver a different kind of report or deliverable. They each have their own standard or guidance document for how the evaluation is done. And they all have uh, various list screening and evaluation programs. Uh, however, uh, the manufacturer inventory using green screen uh, green screen is also used by DHPD, so uh, there is a common uh, list screening method there. And then there are other programs that are in consideration, uh, and there will be more um, because there are a variety of organizations that care about reporting uh, material ingredients of products, and so we're going to look at a, a few of these um, as well. What's the difference between them at the highest level? A couple of them are disclosure programs, and a couple of them, or more, um, are rating system programs. They all follow the same steps. And this uh, diagram comes from the harmonization effort uh, that the USGBC and Google funded to uh, help these organizations uh, standardize and harmonize on the back end, um, we are effectively harmonizing on the front end. Um, but even though the process is similar, each presents a range of differences um, and affordances. And of course, they have different deliverables. And so we broke it down by those stages in the process to see what was happening in each of those programs in terms of disclosure, VOC content, Who's required to do the project? Can you do it yourself? Do you need a consultant? Uh, is there hazard uh, screening and disclosure or not? Who publishes the report? Uh, does it require third-party verification? Is it optional? Is it available? And the same thing 
for the rating systems. Um, just as a note, when you exit the webcast today, there's a quick uh, exit poll, and one of the questions is, would you like to receive a PDF of this deck? Just let us know, and we'll send this deck out to you. What it comes down to is there are a few criteria that a manufacturer will have to prioritize for themselves uh, in terms of how do you select a program that fits your needs. Uh, and this is in no order of importance. You're going to have to decide what's important. Are you concerned about disclosing proprietary ingredients or hazards? Is brand important? Is third-party verification important? And finally, price is always important, and there are a lot of different variables. And lastly, we took a look at which questions get answered by each of these programs. And you'll notice Declare is the only one that answers where do materials come from and where do they go at the end. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to James uh, for a report on the Living Building Challenge and Declare. Thanks, Terry. Um, I think, you know, the, what I really liked about what you're presenting is that this, this information is complicated, life cycle analysis information as well as ingredient disclosure information. And I think the DECLARE program and the Living Building Challenge um, as well as Sustainable Minds are really um, aligned behind the idea of making this information functional and accessible. Um, and easy for consumers to use in, in order to make decisions. Um, and in this case, consumers are really um, specifiers and designers. All right. Can you get a dance for slides there? Um, the Living Building Challenge um, is a green building certification program. A lot of people sort of describe it like lead on steroids. Um, our goal is to push the industry as fast as possible, um, much beyond what, what has currently been sort of conceived as best practice. Um, it uses the metaphor of a flower to describe the type of building that, that we think uh, should be designed, really using nature as the ultimate measuring stick of performance. Um, so the first requirement is that a building harvests all of its energy and water on site, meaning um, it exists within the carrying capacity of the site in which it's located. Um, then it's adapted to climate and site. Um, so a living building in the Pacific Northwest is going to be different from a living, than a living building in Phoenix, um, just like a Douglas fir tree would be different from a cactus in Oran Desert. Um, and then Importantly, we want our buildings to be beautiful, and we think be beauty is an important aspect of sustainability that's often missed in current sustainability certification programs. Unless something is cherished um, and respected by its community, um, it's not going to last, and it's not, um, and it's certainly not going to inspire others to follow along on the footsteps of designing these type of structures. Um, and to continue the metaphor just a little bit longer, uh, we also would like our buildings to be um, completely toxin-free, um, to use architecture and, and chemistry um, the way nature does, um, instead of these toxic synthetic compounds that are so pervasive in building products today. And the Living Building Challenge is really intended to sort of go beyond where most green building certification systems fit today. Um, which is really just to reduce the negative um, environmental impact of a project. 30% more energy efficient, 40% more energy efficient, et cetera, um, and rather push teams to design projects that actually have a positive impact, uh, produce more renewable energy than they create, um, than they use, rather, um, rather than just simply being less bad. Um, and as applied to sort of material health and toxicity, you know, instead of just saying that you need to have some materials that are low emitting um, or, or less likely to give you cancer. We want to design buildings that are completely free of toxic chemicals so that by their very nature they can't give you cancer. Um, 
and we call this sort of space within the, the design realm um, the regenerative space, uh, where you're actually creating a, pro a pro project that has a positive impact on environment and society. So when the Living Building Challenge was created, um, you know, the, the challenges of net positive water um, existing purely within the carrying capacity of your site or net positive energy, uh, producing all the energy you need through on-site renewable technology um, seem daunting. Um, however, what we found was actually the, the third kind of key requirement of the program, which is the use of all non-toxic materials, uh, was actually the most difficult part of the challenge. Um, when the program was launched, um, it was really, uh, the information just wasn't out there in the marketplace um, in order for teams to, to make decisions. Um, so I'm going to go through one of the requirements of the materials pedal that's relevant to declare, um, and that's the requirement to avoid all toxic chemicals on the red list. So the red list is comprised of 22 of the worst in class toxic chemicals and compounds that are pervasive um, in the building product industry today. Um, these are things that many of you on the phone will be familiar with, um, asbestos, um, PVC, um, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, CFCs, and hydrochlorofluorocarbons. Um, as well as sort of new chemicals that are coming on the radar um, of many of us, uh, such as EPA. Uh, and it also includes, and this is a new addition in the Living Building Challenge version 3.0, um, volatile organic compounds in wet applied products. Um, so um, the red list is, is looking at sort of what are the, the worst chemicals um, that are common in building products and asking each one of our project teams to screen all the materials in their building um, to ensure they're free of these toxic compounds. Hey James, can I ask a quick question? Sure. This is this is from one of the um, attendees. Uh, with regards to toxic materials, what's the basis for toxic, and what are the guidelines, and who sets them? So the the red list is is basically a harmonization, and we worked within the the harmonization group um, to do this of the EPA chemicals of concern, the REACH substances of very high concern, um, as well as the cradle-to-cradle -cradle band list. So the red list is essentially a list of those two authoritative hazard lists, uh, what the EPA has determined as toxic chemicals that need to have an action plan published for them, uh, what the European Union REACH legislation has determined, um, as well as the cradle-to-cradle -cradle band list. Um, and the focus is really on persistent bioaccumulative toxic chemicals um, that are pervasive in the build, built environment um, and are most likely to cause um, danger to, to humans and the environment. Um, and I think that there's always a question with red lists. You know, the red list could clearly be longer. There could be additional items added to it. Uh, what we have determined in collaboration with our partners, um, with other experts in the field, and also through testing out the program on the ground with our project teams all over the world, um, is these are really the key ingredients that in the current market today uh, can be removed um, and we can make progress on um, and, and removing and detoxifying the built environment. Um, the, those, those 22 chemicals are, are actually um, representative of uh, chemical groups rather than specific chemicals. Um, and I think that's something important that everybody should recognize. And in fact, there's over 777 unique chemical cast numbers um, that are uh, included within those 22 categories of chemicals. Um, the, the focus, again, like I mentioned, is really on persistent bioaccumulative toxic 
chemicals within the red list. And what I mean by that is, is often I think with uh, material health, um, us as designers are, are thinking about our um, sort of personal impact or the impact of our decisions on the um, on the occupants of the buildings that we're designing. Uh, but actually, most of the impact of a toxic chemical um, happen in the production. Um, and manufacturing of that chemical, and then in the disposal um, of that chemical at the end of its life. Uh, one story that's sort of particularly powerful for me, I live in Seattle in the Pacific Northwest. It's a small sailboat um, that I use out there. Um, and it's sort of home of, of the orca whale. Um, and I was listening to a presentation by um, a designer who designed um, a very famous building in Seattle called the Bullet Center. Um, and what he was describing to me is that orca whales actually have the highest concentration of flame retardants, um, which are an item that's banned on the red list of any creature on the planet. Um, and it has significant effect on their health. And in fact, the female orca whales download um, the toxic chemicals that build up in their bodies um, into um, their firstborn calf. Um, and when that calf is nursing, they actually are able to, to take a, a significant amount of that toxic load, um, which impacts their health, uh, but also allows the, the females to live much longer. So female orca whales in our current environment live much longer than males uh, because they're able to download this toxic load. Um, so I think it's important, and that was really sort of shocking to me, and it made me realize that we need to think much broader about the impact of our decisions um, on the Earth um, not only for human and environmental health, uh, but also for overall ecosystem health. Um, and so the red list is not just those items that are that are likely to impact your health, uh, but they're also those items that can impact um, ecosystem health throughout the entire life cycle production of the, of the chemical used in it. Um, so in 2006, when the Living Building Challenge uh, red list was, was announced and the program began, um, essentially it was nearly impossible for manufacturers, or for, for project teams rather, to get information out of manufacturers um, in order to make decisions about how um, they could find red list products. Um, so the DECLARE program was created um, to, to bridge that gap, um, to provide a platform for manufacturers to disclose their ingredients, um, and then also a database um, so that Living Building Challenge project teams would actually know which products complied uh, with the program. Um, as you can see, it's a very straightforward label, um, similar to a nutrition tract that you'd find on the back of a cereal box. Um, and we currently have over 300 labels, um, and the program is growing um, exponentially at this point. We'll probably have more than 350 by the end of this week, uh, with companies like Toto, who's going to speak next, that are actually using the DECLARE program to go through their entire product line. Um, and there's kind of two benefits of this. One is the tool to connect the Living Building Challenge project team, as well as lead projects and other people who are interested um, in the sustainability and health attributes of products. Um, but it's also a tool for, for self-reflection. Manufacturers, when they're able to list their products and screen them versus the red list, often discover that, that they could make some changes. They could remove some items that have uh, life cycle toxicity concerns. And, and Toto is actually able to do that uh, with some small PVC components in their project, in their product, and, and looking to do so uh, with some of the finishes. Um, we think Declare is part of an overall movement uh, for ingredient transparency and disclosure um, that's really starting to take hold in the building product industry. Uh, we think it parallels in, in a lot of ways um, uh, the way that the um, food labeling movement um, developed, which essentially started with consumers demanding information and often manufacturers pushing back and saying, no, this is actually our proprietary trade secret. Um, I don't think any of us today would accept a manufacturer telling us of food products that the ingredients they use in it are their proprietary trade secret. Um, and I don't think we as designers should accept that for manufacturers too. And, and leading companies like Toto are actually pushing the envelope um, and showing a path forward um, that manufacturers actually can be transparent with their consumers uh, while protecting those legitimate trade secrets that they have in the manufacturing process or the distribution of how the product functions. Uh, 
Declare is a pretty straightforward and simple program. Um, again, trying to take complex ingredient information and make it easy to use. Um, it asks three questions. Where does the product come from? What is it made of? And where does it go at the end of the slide? Um, since the Living Building Challenge was launched in 2006, we now have over 284 projects um, globally in 14 countries. Um, and as you can see here, over 301 Declare products. When this map was made about um, three weeks ago, I think we'll be pushing 350 products by the end of this week. Um, and so for the manufacturers out there, these projects and the growth rate of these projects are actually driving demand for Declare products. Uh, but what we've discovered is that actually um, being honest and transparent with your consumers through a program like Declare, um, since it also needs the ingredient disclosure credit within the D4, um, as well as, as credits within the well standard, um, has taken on a life of its own and actually is growing faster um, and, and uh, more quickly than the number of Living Building Challenge projects themselves. And, and we're even seeing architecture firms requiring um, declare labels or red list free products um, for a manufacturer to be listed um, in somebody's product library. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kristen at Toda. While Kristen's teeing up, I will just say, um, James, thank you. That was really informative and um, fantastic to hear about the accelerated growth in the DECLARE program and how uh, it, the Living Building Challenge goals are driving demand for, for products that have DECLARE labels. So that really is a great incentive for manufacturers to get declare labels. Yeah, James, yeah, that's, re that's really exciting because when I attended the uh, in, uh, Living Futures Institute on conference just, I guess, last year, the project number was at 199. So it's really exciting to see it really taking off now. Yeah, thank you. And, and one thing I would, would credit, um, and I think this is one kind of issue that you brought up um, too, Carrie, is the way in which the LEED B4 credit um, the Living Building Challenge materials requirements, um, the well credit, as well as sort of the overall sentiment in the industry is coalescing behind transparency. It's helping to have all these grow programs grow um, in an exponential way together. Um, and we're really excited about that harmonization and how the programs are, are now working together. All right, Kristen, show us how it's done. All right. Um, all right, guys, my name is Kristen Gertz. I'm the Associate Quality Engineer with Toto USA. I've been serving as the Project Manager for Toto's Transparency Report Program, and more recently, Toto's first release of its material health evaluations via the DECLARE label. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Toto's experience with creating the material health evaluation. Toto's been conducting LCAs. Uh, beginning back in 2009, and we were looking for a way to communicate these studies with the market. So we partnered with Sustainable Minds, and in 2013 began releasing a series of transparency reports to communicate our LCA findings to our consumer base. Uh, since that first release, we've published transparency reports that represent 16 of our products with more to come. Um, and offering LCA information to the customers has been one of the first steps in a series of transparency initiatives. So it follows that we would want to include the material health evaluations to accompany those products as well. If you've ever conducted an LCA study, you will be aware, you know that this requires you to build an extensive inventory on the life cycle of a product, and especially what materials you're using um, 
and what goes into that product in manufacturing. So the inventory for an LCA will include pretty much all the information you need to generate a material health evaluation. In a way, the material evaluation builds upon an LCA study. You don't have to have done an LCA to do a material evaluation, but by conducting the LCA, you have the main building blocks for the material evaluation. Those main building blocks are the material, what's present in your product, and what percent of that material makes up the total mass of that product. And it's normally reported at uh, 100 ppm. There's some other bits of data, like recycled content and the material, um, appropriate mode of disposal, such as landfilling or recycling. And these will be included in your LCA inventory as well. So with those basic building blocks, you still may need to take a little bit of a deeper dive into the material aspect of the, the bill of materials. Some of these materials in your product may not necessarily be included in an LCA model due to cutoff criteria, but in a material evaluation, you will want to be as inclusive as possible. You really don't want to leave anything out. So sometimes you may have to go back and um, investigate those materials a little further. The material evaluation platforms do require a cast number, which is not necessarily something that you would collect in your LCA inventory, because LCA inventory, um, the modeling inputs don't require cast, but you will need that for uh, to do your material evaluation. So what this means is that you have to have a strong relationship with your supply base. If you're sourcing materials um, from other from suppliers and on various tiers, you'll need to have a strong relationship with them. This is often a prerequisite for an LCA, but it, it is my belief it's even more critical for the material evaluation. You'll, you'll probably have to reach out to those suppliers to get the appropriate cast number for that specific makeup of material that they're supplying to you. So fortunately, um, Toto has been working with suppliers that have been very willing very open and working with us throughout the project. We had one supplier even take the red list and uh, their lab went through it and verified that there were no red list materials in, the, in what they were supplying to us. So we were really fortunate that they were so willing to work with us. Um, but also too, we did for some select materials do some in-house testing we also did some third-party testing to validate what the supplier was reporting to us. So it's not something we would necessarily do with an LCA, but like I said, when you're doing a material evaluation, it may require a deeper dive into uh, the materials BOM of a product. So having collected the LCA inventory for many of our products, we've been prepared to do the material evaluation for some time. We just had to decide on the correct platform. Um, we had to decide what was best for us. Uh, there's many options currently on the market. We, we explored some of them. Um, they all have their own set of qualities. They all have their own set of challenges. And we based our decision on several things, such as how accurately does it represent our product and the associated hazards? What is the cost? How often do you renew? How easy or complicated? Are the reporting requirements? What does it achieve in the market? Um, and also, is it aligned with the company's underlying culture and goals and objectives? We selected Declare for a few different reasons. Um, first off, we love the foundation that the Declare label is built upon. We really like the mission and the purpose of, of livability challenge. We appreciate the rigor that's involved. And we wanted to see where our product stood in terms of the Living Building Challenge requirements and the red list. So we really felt we could stand out with the Declare label. Um, one thing that really attracted us as well was the ease of use. <coughs> the reporting requirements were not overly complicated or arduous. Uh, it was very straightforward. You complete this questionnaire and you submit it to Declare. Um, so doing a material evaluation in general is very challenging, so it's nice that the forms for the declare label are relatively simplistic. 
Uh, the declarer team reviewed the forms that we submitted, and there was a bit of Q&A between Declare and Toto to ensure that the product list was complete and that it would ultimately be understandable by the customer. So I actually had to go back and revise uh, the, the product questionnaire based upon feedback from the Declare team. So it was really nice to know that the rigor is in place, um, and we really appreciate that. Um, but it's also nice that the reporting process is not more complicated than it needed to be. So another consideration was um, the functionality in the marketplace. The declare label can satisfy requirements of the lead before rating system, and depending on the ingredients, can also help satisfy the requirements of the living building challenge. These are two areas that we get a lot of questions about. So we felt that the declare label was perfect because we'd be able to address both of those for our customers. For LEED, it serves as a manufacturer's inventory, it's meaning that we have made public the list of materials using the cast number. This is what it would look like. This is what it looks like on the Declare Products website. So you can see all materials are listed up to 100 ppm with the cast number. So that will require, uh, that will satisfy the requirements of LEED before. The label also satisfies requirements of the Living Building Challenge. Uh, it directly addresses imperatives 10, 12, and 13. We've been getting a lot of requests for, um, you know, our, do you have materials that are on the red list? Can you fill out these forms for us? So this was an easy way, um, as James mentioned earlier, to bridge that gap between the customers and what we as a manufacturer are doing. So we can give them the declare label uh, and make the process much more simple for them. You can see that the PVC free version of the Eco Ultramax featured here um, is an LVC compliant toilet, which up to this point they've struggled to find. So we're real happy that we've been able to bring this um, declare label to the market. Now, as I said before, we selected Declare for the, the straightforwardness and simplicity when it comes to the reporting requirements. We also felt that the label was very easy to use by the customer. It's a clean, concise label, much like a nutrition label. There's not too much information present to create confusion. Um, and because we were planning on using Sustainable Minds to present the label on the transparency report, we felt that the uncomplicatedness would work best with that format as well. Um, the label presents the list of ingredients. It highlights those areas that are of concern in a simple format. So this is, desi this is desirable. It works well embedded in the material health overview of the transparency report. And we're able to provide an interpretation section to discuss the implications of the label. So anything that you would see highlighted in orange would indicate a chemical or material of concern, and we're actually able to discuss what Toto is doing as a company um, to address um, these concerns. And I think this is helpful for our customers because it reduces the amount of paperwork that they need to collect. Um, it streamlines the process on our end of how we communicate our sustainable actions to the customer, um, and it makes it more understandable. So at this time, I'll turn it back over to Terry. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Kristen. Um, you you teed me up for the wrap up um, quite nicely. So as Kristen pointed out, uh, they chose Declare because of ease of use and they liked the simplicity of, of the rating system and they wanted to be able to include material health. Uh, alongside the uh, life cycle impacts that they were already reporting. And so because they were already doing LCA and creating transparency reports, we were able to keep our promise, the little uh, wiggle room, that a transparency report would only ever be three pages. Uh, page two, which is LCA results and interpretation, now becomes LCA and material health results and interpretation. Uh, and now the user can toggle between 
these two tabs uh, and using the same page layout, understand the technical requirements of the program used to deliver the results. And then the part that is really um, the most contributory to our whole premise of building a credibly greener brand is the interpretation section. So just like in an LCA, there's interpretation and there's an interpretation section, the right column of the transparency report is the interpretation section, uh, sorry, the right column for the material health overview is the interpretation section. And so the interpretation section is a little bit different for each of the assessment methods, just in the same way that the technical scope and the results are displayed. Um, so when it's a rating system or an eco-label, we ask the manufacturer to talk about how the rating was achieved. You know, what does it mean to have achieved one of these levels? How did you do it? What's in the product and why? Uh, discuss sourcing. And this is part of the template. Uh, this is suggested content that the manufacturer might choose to write about. But the idea is, if you're disclosing this technical information, explain what it means. Explain to the user what this stuff means over here. It's really as, as simple as that. And then, how are you making the product healthier? What are you doing now? What are you doing in the future to continue to drive, drive these improvements? Now, many manufacturers um, will probably never do an LCA or LCAs uh, and will not produce transparency reports. So the material health overview is available as a standalone report where we take all the content from page one of the transparency report, so it's all the product information, functional performance, specifications, links to the manufacturer's website, uh, their standards and rating systems, uh, and we add the material health overview there, you know, all, all in a single page. We're also developing um, this optional multi-attribute zone where other uh, data items that contribute to points and other rating systems uh, can also be, be added. So it's really a modular approach to reporting. And then all of the transparency products that the manufacturer makes get linked from their brand showroom, so everything is all in one place. Uh, and having content in the cloud means that it can be reused, redirected, People can find it uh, from multiple points of entry. And just to uh, make it all more real, uh, this is uh, Toto's brand showroom. And I'll show you the, uh, the new material health overviews that they've created. I'm showing you this one first because Kristen talked about it. And this is very exciting. Um, this is a standalone material health overview for their PVC free toilet. And if it didn't come through, I'd like to say it again, which was that going through the declare process highlighted for Toto uh, the PVC issue, which drove Toto to develop this PVC free product and be able to uh, take advantage of telling that story. How was the rating achieved? What's in the product and why? The red list materials that they have eliminated and are working on eliminating and how we're making it healthier. So they've really taken advantage of this opportunity to um, tell their story about what they've done and what they're continuing to do. And again, because it's in the cloud, I can click on any of these links. I can go to the Declare website, see the full uh, Declare disclosure. We're on a little bit of a slow connection. Um, and I can read the whole standard. I can link to the rating system. Uh, I can go to the Living Future Institute. I can contact Toto. Um, one note, a declare label is considered self-declared. It's not third party verified because the ILFI is the second party. So declare is a self-declared label, and 
that's for you to determine whether uh, that's okay, not okay. Uh, there are other options. It's completely up to you. You can download download this PDF here in the uh, in the Ultramax two. Uh, you can see uh, that we've added the material health overview to this transparency report. We can toggle between the life cycle assessment results and the material health results. Here's the interpretation. So the life cycle impacts, what's causing the greatest impacts, just like how is this rating achieved. So technical information on the left, interpretation on the right, uh, rating system values, and it's, it's all there in one place. And you can certainly download the PDF and have that on, on hand as well. So to wrap it up, who are Sustainable Mind Transparency products for? We like to say, just quite simply, if your company believes that better marketing helps sales, that's kind of the number one threshold. Um, and then secondarily, uh, if you're a manufacturer who cares about leadership in your industry, innovation and design of your products and your brand, transparency reports are for you. If you're thinking holistically and longer term, you're making greener products than before, you want to provide useful and understandable information to help make better informed decisions, transparency reports and our transparency products are for you. These are new kinds of transparency marketing tools that don't exist in other programs. So here at Sustainable Minds, we sell software and services to help manufacturers design and market greener products. And we are very, very proud uh, to partner with organizations like the ILSI and to work with manufacturers uh, and the folks at those manufacturers uh, like Kristen and her team who really do care about uh, making greener and healthier products and uh, educating the market in, in the process. So we've gone a little bit over time. Um, we will follow up with you. If there are questions that you leave as you exit, if you'll take a minute uh, as you leave to do that, that'd be great. And we do encourage you to um, register for uh, any of the two remaining webcasts. Uh, we have Stacy Glass from Cradle to Cradle Product Innovation Institute on Tuesday and following that, we have Annie Bevan from Green Circle Certified and special guests from Clean Production Action to talk about green screen and how to do manufacturer's inventories that qualify for lead B4. So there are a lot of choices. Uh, they're all great. Uh, we're learning a lot as we go through this process and we hope you'll continue to join us. So I want to thank you, James and Kristen, for spending the time and, and sharing your stories. And I want everyone to uh, have a great day. Thank you.